Hi, everyone. I'm Helen Altschuler, former a team member for Bazel at Google and uh, currently CEO and co-founder for Engflow. I'll be facilitating the rest of the uh, conference today, taking over from Ed Scouten, who did a great job facilitating it earlier this morning. If you're joining us today for, uh, for the first time, welcome and uh, please take a look at the uh, agenda. We've got great speakers lined up as well as interactive sessions. Also to recap, these sessions are uh, going to be live streamed. Uh, most of them, we do have a few panels. And so if you have questions, uh, there is a questions uh, tab that you can ask and post that up both questions as well as chat with your colleagues uh, throughout the talks. So I'm super excited to welcome Ed Scouten back on stage, a very, very prominent uh, community member in the Basel space and also a uh, creator of Build Barn. So, um... As I was just telling the people backstage, I'm going to be all out of a voice by the end of this day. I mean, the uh, like all moderating all the talks in the morning and also like the the, the very awesome um, uh, breakout sessions we had today. That was really good. And, and now I've got like 30 minutes more of talking uh, ahead of me. So the topic I'm going to talk about today is uh, a pretty technical one named automatic worker size selection for build barn using feedback driven analysis. Before actually touching upon that specific subject, I thought it would be good to sort of like give a pretty brief recap of what the Build Barn project is for who of you who don't know. So Build Barn is basically a remote execution uh, cluster implementation and remote execution service that you can use for build tools like Bazel to perform either remote cache or remote execution. It consists of a bunch of separate projects that you can either like use all of them if you want to, or you can just select the, you know, the interesting parts that you want to use. So first and foremost, there is a daemon called BB storage and BB storage has quite a lot of different use cases depending on the configuration file you feed it. But like, I think you could sort of like uh, group it into three different use cases. First of all, you can use BB storage as a centralized storage node. So like an actual node that holds onto data for a remote caching or remote uh, execution uh, cluster, or which you can see on, on the right-hand side of this diagram, like the, uh, the, the cylinder shaped uh, icons. Then on the left of that, you can also use it as a demultiplexing daemon for like picking up gRPC traffic and forwarding it either to storage nodes or a scheduler for remote execution depending on whether it's a storage request or a remote execution request. Or you can even configure it as an on-premise cache if you want to that sits in front of one or more clusters. Um, then there's also BB remote execution that consists of a bunch of processes named BB scheduler, the one that you see in the bottom middle on the, on the cluster side, which basically holds onto a queue of things that needs to be run. And on the right-hand side of the diagram, you see so-called BB worker and runner processes that are basically responsible for interacting with storage, interacting with the scheduler, picking up work, executing it, and returning the results. Um, then there's also like a couple of sort of, um, you know, tools that you can either use on the client side to make your life easier. So for example, BB browser is a page we'll see later that you can use to explore the content managed by BRE, uh, sorry, by, uh, by Build Barn. And, um, there's also a daemon called BB Client D that you can use to add a fuse file system to Bazel to add lazy loading. So, you know, as I mentioned, not all of these parts are required to use. Uh, you know, there are many people who only use BB storage and some others that only use BB storage and the simple remote execution parts. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about like all about BB scheduler. So here's sort of like the uh, a relatively simple description I can give of, of BB Scheduler. Uh, over time, BB Scheduler has become like a lot more complex, gained a lot more functionality. But like in essence, you can think of it as a whole bunch of queues that are placed in inside of each other, like a bunch of nested queues. So first of all, the scheduler doesn't just keep track of a single queue of actions it needs to run. It can keep track of multiple queues, namely for separate operating systems on which you run to run uh, build actions. So it's perfectly valid to create a single cluster that has a single scheduler, but multiple pools of workers that each run a different operating system. So Ubuntu, CentOS, macOS, Windows, et cetera. Um, then um, uh, inside of that, there is um, uh, separate queues, which will, will be sort of the main topic of today. Namely, inside of each so-called platform queue, there's a whole bunch of size classes, 
uh, size class queues for the different uh, size of workers, but more on that later. Inside of each size class queue, we have a queue of Bazel invocations. So namely, you know, if every time someone runs Bazel, Bazel generates a unique UUID and that gets attached to all the requests that Bazel generates uh, uh, when making outgoing or like that, that gets attached to all outgoing RPCs. Well, the scheduler makes one queue for each of those. And inside of each of those invocation queues, there is a list of scheduled operations, actions. And the scheduler has been made in such a way that it steers towards fairness between Bazel invocations. So this means if multiple people run Bazel at the same time, it doesn't really matter how high, how high they set the dash J flag. If they set it to dash J a million and someone sets it to a lower value, um, you know, the scheduler will still try to do its best to like give everyone its fair share and you know not naively give that one invocation of Bazel more capacity. Yeah. The scheduler has been made in such a way that it's not persistent. It just keeps the queue in memory. Uh, this means that if you restart, then like all information about which workers run which operations is lost. Um, it's generally not an issue um, because it only like it if you configure Bazel properly with proper remote timeout flags or uh, once again remote retries, then this doesn't even cause any interruptions of the build. It only causes like momentary slowdown. And um, uh, you know, considering that the scheduler is, tends to be restarted infrequently. Um, you know, that's absolutely not an issue. So um, the scheduler also has a gRPC protocol and an integrated web UI for exploring the current state of the worker. For the gRPC protocol, we're not using like the traditional uh, uh, long running API, gRPC API that exists, but we use a custom one. And the reason for that is that the long running API, you know, doesn't really describe all of like the nested queuing that the scheduler can do. It provides inadequate facilities for actually like, you know, understanding what's going on under the hood. In terms of like worker scheduler communication, um, PB scheduler unfortunately uses a custom protocol, um, which is a bit of a shame. So that means that you can't combine build barn scheduler with say build farms workers. There's simply no consensus in the community of what the right shape of a protocol looks like at this point. And also like, you know, the, the protocol that build barn uses isn't, isn't like fully crystallized. It, it tends to change over time. So um, here's like a screenshot of what the scheduler UI looks like. It's not the most beautiful page, but at some point you get used to it. Um, you know, you basically see a single list for every platform for which workers are known. And there you can sort of take a look at each of the basal invocations uh, that are known at that point in time. And, you know, how many of those have one or more actions queued. So like whether there's any overflow going on where like actions can't be run immediately. And then there's another column that shows you how many workers there are for a certain platform and how many of those are in the executing state. There's also something called drains that you see in the right hand side where you can like install patterns of which workers should not receive any work because they are, for example, under maintenance. Yeah. So worker size classes. What does this talk about? What is the problem we're trying to solve? Well, if you take a look at sort of like all the build actions that someone would run in the cluster, so you would like, you know, take all of the actions that were run within the last week or so, and you would sort of put them sort of in a graph and you would sort them by uh, resource utilization or resource usage. So like how many CPU cores could this action use or how much RAM could this action use? You see that it's basically like a hockey stick curve where like the vast majority of them, 99% or 99.9% .9 of the actions maybe, they, they can work with say a gigabyte of RAM and a single CPU core, but then there's like a handful of actions and you know those those are the exp the expensive ones. Those need multi-threaded, multi-CPU workers, and they need a lot of RAM. So what can you do? One way to solve it is to basically only run workers with lots of CPU cores and lots of RAM, but you'll quickly discover that that's really expensive. So um, the traditional way of solving this with like remote execution is to use so-called different platform properties. So what you do is that on the Bazel side, you um, you sort of annotate your build action saying like, you know, this they shouldn't just run on an ordinary Ubuntu system, it should run on a large Ubuntu system. And, you know, there's multiple ways of encoding that by like, you know, either having just a label that says small, you know, has a value small or large, or you could go as complex as to say as like, you know, this needs exactly so much RAM and exactly so much CPU, but it, it doesn't, it generally does need to be annotated in build files. Um, but the problem with that is that it's sort of like a race to the bottom. 
right? People start to add those annotations to all of their build files. Um, you know, I just want my rest, my test to run fast. It's a big test. I think this is a big test. So just let me run on the on the largest worker you have. Uh, and the end result is that basically half of your tests end to be end up being the expensive ones. So um, the problem is also that Bayesal sort of lacks, you know, the granularity to sort of specify this properly. So in case you have release builds, debug bond builds, ASAN builds, or, you know, in those cases, you can't like easily specify and build files like this normally needs only a gigabyte of RAM, but in the case of ASAN, it's two gigabytes, right? That all becomes too granular at some point. Also in the case of sharded tests, uh, as far as I know, Bazel doesn't provide any facilities for saying, you know, shard 31 out of 50 needs more RAM than the rest or something like that. It's also undesirable to do it like that. Um, you know, and also it's really hard for like a third party library offer to figure out what the right resource limits are for a specific use case. So nobody specifies them. So, um, you know, also when you redesign your cluster to have different worker sizes, you know, a new cloud instance comes out with more or less RAM than before. Well, you need to like re-annotate your entire code base. So the goal is to let Build Barn do it itself. So what is the rough outline of the solution uh, that, that Build Barn has for us? Well, it's um, I, I sort of made this diagram with like some you know, numbers next to it. It indicated what like what order and execution is going to take place now. So as before, Bazel is going to send an execute request to the scheduler, asking it like, you know, could you please run this action? Instead of like immediately picking a worker on which it needs to run and waking up this worker and you know giving it a copy of the execute request, it's now going to like read an object from a data store, which uh, we'll call the ISCC, which stands for initial size class cache, to basically get a bunch of statistics on how actions of that shape behave. So like historical executions of similar actions, right? And based on those statistics, step three, the scheduler will pick a sort of optimal size on which this action needs to be run, right? And then, you know, based on that, it picks a worker of that specific size. In most, most of the times that will succeed, right? Uh, the historical statistics are accurate and properly describe how the action behaves, but sometimes it can also fail. And when that happens, it will like fall back to the largest size class. You know, we've disappointed the user by running it on, a, on an incorrect worker. The, 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 the user is still waiting for the results. So now we're like, you know, just going to give up and run it on the largest worker and, you know, accept the loss. Then um, when either like this one build on like a smaller size class or, you know, potentially two builds on like a smaller and a larger size class have succeeded, we write an updated entry to the IECC, basically adding more sort of timestamp information, more like result data to that cache. So that like in the future, a better prediction can be made. And when all of that is done, we write an execute response back to the client. Yeah. So what makes this a bit of a tricky problem is that it's not like, you know, only about sort of keeping the user happy and that builds succeed. We also need, you know, to make sure that builds still run fast, right? Um, so just looking at the execute, exit code and checking whether it's zero, right, is not sufficient. We actually need to sort of quantify what an acceptable execution time is. If I'm going to tell you that like an action that runs in, in 10 seconds on a four core system, so size class four in this case, uh, takes 11 seconds on a worker that has size class one, so one, one fourth the size, uh, you know, that's acceptable. But if it takes 72 seconds, we can like say for sure that this is unacceptable, right? It's, it's a worker that is one fourth the size, it should at most like cause a slowdown of a factor four, but anything more is, is clearly unacceptable. But what is acceptable is also something that like, it depends on a, you know, um, sort of, uh, you know, on how much you're willing to spend, right? You, you could argue like, you know, if, um, if, an, if I've got a worker that is four times as big and an action is only twice as fast as this, this larger worker, in certain cases that might be acceptable. Some people might be willing to spend the money for that, but some people might not. They might wanna run it on a smaller worker because it's more economical, right? And, um, what, what I did in the scheduler was I basically sort of like, you know, came up with a, a simple 
sort of formula expression to sort of quantify this or you know determine where the cutoff needs to be. And it's actually pretty simple. Uh, what we do is we just take the median execution time of how long it would take on the largest worker. And then what we do is we sort of correct it by like, you know, dividing the size classes with each other. But like, then we have this exponent k that we can use to sort of like act as a knob that we can sort of turn somewhere between zero and one to indicate like how much, like to what degree an action needs, needs to be parallel for it to be eligible to run on a larger worker. So if you set it to k is O of three in this case, it's going to be acceptable if an action, you know, runs in 15 or less seconds on a smaller worker. That's when we will sort of always run it on a smaller worker. But if we set it to O.7, an action can still run for like 26 seconds on, um, on, on a small worker and it would still be acceptable. So like the larger K becomes, the closer you set it to one, the more it will prefer executing on smaller workers. Whereas if you turn it lower, it will like aggressively, even, even when there's like minor amounts of parallelism running on larger workers. So uh, we also use this cutoff to sort of come up with a timeout. So in case actions run for too long on a smaller worker, right? You know, we're not going to run it for like the 72 seconds that we see above. When it reaches the cutoff, I think we sort of have like a safety margin still above that, but then we sort of kill the action and rerun it on the largest one. We Im immediately give up. So here's what like the bookkeeping looks like for what's stored in an initial size class cache. So at the bottom, you can see there's a single message that basically for stores a map where for each size class number, it stores a per size class stats message. And that one is basically just a list of previous outcome messages. And an outcome is not much more, like a previous execution is not much more than like either describing a failed case, we ran the action, but it filled with a non-zero exit code, or it timed out after a given amount of time, or it succeeded after a given amount of time. So the question becomes, how is this initial size class cache indexed, right? Because it's a key value store. What I just show, showed on the previous slide was the values, but um, you know we also need to key it somehow. And uh, what we use for the keys actually like a pretty simple system uh, with the old REV 2.1 protocol would have been sufficient to just use the command digest, which contains the uh, platform properties and uh, command line arguments in the environment variables. So, you know, if, if it's the same command line and environment variables, we basically assume it's a command that has similar, you know, or has, um, you know, comparable performance characteristics. Um, with RIV 2.2, they change it by like promoting the platform properties up from the, like the command message to action. Um, so what we do in our case is that we define something called a reduced action digest, which is basically we take an action message and we strip off everything that can differ for similar, like the execution of similar actions. So the input route's completely ignored, for example. And as that, we compute a SHA sum, and that's going to be like the, the key of our map. Ideally, we would also include like the request metadata's configuration ID in there, because that would be like a really good indicator between whether like debug or release builds are performed. But because it's not stored in the action, but stored as metadata, it's also like easy to sort of like lose this data. And that means that like, the, the the matching could could like become inaccurate at points and it like would wouldn't be able to look up uh, metadata properly yeah so the question is given the results so like you know given data sets along the shape for two different size classes how do we pick the right size class right so only looking at the case where we have two size classes so what what I eventually came up with, what, what turned out to be like a pretty good heuristic is that we take the execution times on those size classes and we correct them using that, that exponent k that I gave on the previous slide. So we end up with sort of like these, these quasi durations, right? They're not like actual wall clock times, but they're sort of like this, these sort of, um, you know, normalized times that allows us to sort of compare between two different size classes. So just two lists of durations. And now we have to determine which size class is better slash faster than the other one, right? Um, so normally what you could do in statistics is you could like compute the, uh, the median of both or like, you know, standard deviations or, you know, variance, that kind of stuff. But the problem is that like, not all the sample values that we have are durations that we can compare against each other, right? I mean, 
if we have a 14 second timeout on a certain size class, is that faster or slower than a 15 second success on the other? Right? It's it, it all becomes messy. Or like, is is a compiler or, or like uh, an, an exit code one better than like an, a timeout? You know, it's it where we we basically have to sort of compare these three different values against each other. So fail timeout and succeeded, whereas like they're not like simple you know, real numbers that we can compare. So instead of like using students, D or that kind of stuff, we're making use of something called the man with me you test, which is a statistical test that you can apply even in the case where you, um, you know, don't deal with like uh, real numbers as sample values, or um, it also even has the advantage that it also works with distributions that are not normal. So, so that that's pretty good. But that, this is sort of like, you know, a sort of a quadratic component that we use in our comparison. So the one that sort of like almost dominates. If you have a lot of sample values, we basically just perform the man with the new test. But like in case you have like only a few samples to work on, so we only ran it once or twice on a smaller size class, um, you know, we, we can't really do a lot of sort of decent statistical analysis. So what we do is we have like a so called linear and constant component in there. And this makes sure that like if, if you've only ran an action like a very small number of times, only once or twice, that you sort of uh, prefer that size class again, so that we can like uh, you know force a bit more training on that size class to figure out what its actual performance characteristics are. And there's also like a constant component in there to ensure that like if we you know uh, compute a ratio or like a probability of one being better that we never divide by zero. And this is like an asymmetric relationship, of course. So if you, it's faster a b plus b a equals zero, uh, sorry one, of course. Right, that that's the probability because it's asymmetric. Yeah, and based on that like number that comes out of it, right? Uh, th this this probability function just gives a number between zero and one. Uh, you know, we just pick a random number and compare it against that, and based on that, we pick a certain size class. So if out of is faster comes the value o dot eight, that means that there's like an eighty percent chance that we pick, uh, you know, a given size class over the other, right? But this is only for like a two-way size class comparison. But now, how do we do it with n size classes? If you have like three or four different worker sizes, like small, uh, medium, and large, well, what we do is we sort of like reuse this is faster function that we have, and we sort of uh, put it in a matrix like you see here. And if you use this matrix and you sort of compute the eigenvector out of it, um, what's really, what's pretty funny is that you then end up with like a list of probabilities for, um, you know multiple size classes that all add up to one. So uh, that's sort of exactly what we do. We, we just you know, use this matrix, compute the eigenvector, and this gives us like a pretty decent probability distribution for, uh, for like all those size classes. And this is somewhat similar to how like the page rank algorithm works that like search engines like Google use in the, at least in the past. You know, we're basically just creating our own mini internet consisting of, in this case, four web pages where like, you know, the web pages, they normally have links to each other, but it's basically, in this case, size classes that can vote on each other and sort of say, like, I think that this other size class is better than me at running this action, so I'm go going to give it a higher score. So, um, you know, we do apply some tricks to make sure that builds run fast. Uh, if an action fails, we always run it on a large size class, so if people do incremental builds, they, you know, uh, fixing compiler errors, we can deal with that properly. And uh, we also have some optimizations in place to make sure that, like, uh, you know, actions for which we have a low certainty, that we um, sort of do always run them on the largest one, and then do some more training in the background. So we run actions in the in the background after the build is completed to figure out uh, whether in the future it makes sense to run them on smaller smaller size classes again. Yeah. So. Um, here, this is what it looks like if you take a look at sort of BB Schedule Web UI now. There's now an extra column there, size class, where you can see that they're like for every size of worker, you can now sort of inspect uh, inspect the state of like the workers. I was also, um, yeah, want to show you like what this background learning looks like. So now, you know, the scheduler can run some actions in the background to sort of like, uh, you know, train them uh, for, for the future. So uh, to make like, in case we have like a low probability of them succeeding on a small size class, uh, they'll show up like as being in a background learning state. So they won't be associated with any, any given client. So also in BB browser. Um, so uh, 
there's only like a small number of minutes left, so I'm going to skip this specific slide. BB Browser is basically a web page where you can sort of take a look at the, the, the sort of cast contents. And um, in there, uh, you know, normally you can inspect the command that's being invoked, uh, what kind of input files are in the input route, right? It's a pretty decent debugging tool for this. And for like a, a completed invocation of an action, you can sort of get timestamp information, information about like which work it ran on. Um, and also like resource usage. Well, now there's sort of two additional uh, uh, or screenshots I want to show you. So where you can actually like at the bottom of every page, you can now see like how long the action ran for on uh, different kinds of size classes and it shows a scatter plot. So here you see an action that doesn't scale at all. Like if you run on a larger worker, it doesn't speed up at all. So it always picks a smaller one. And here you actually have an action that does scale up properly. It becomes a lot faster on a smaller, uh, on a larger worker. And that's where you can also see where most of the invocations ended up being. So um, this is all I have to, to say about this topic. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Thank you, Ed. And uh, yeah, definitely would love to hear audience questions. So far, nothing has come in, but uh, we'd like to hear more. Yeah, please feel free to post your questions in the questions uh, tab. In the meantime, Ed, maybe you can just talk a little bit more about what you had to get a glass over in your slides uh, and uh, uh, ex explain a, a little bit more some of the slides you weren't able to share with us. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, you know, I saw uh, I was already getting close to, to, to the end. Yeah, yeah so um, yeah, what, what you have is, of course, like um, if so, certain actions, like even if there's like a 99 probability that an action is going to fill on a small worker, right? You know that it always must run on a large worker to succeed. You still have to run it on a small worker at some point because otherwise the st statistics you store in the initial size class cache it simply becomes stale, right? So sometimes you sort of have, have to go against sort of like your good judgment. And um, whenever that happens, or, or like uh, whenever you sort of get that 1% probability that like you, you pick the wrong size class, we're sort of like running it the other way around where we're like first running it on the large worker. And if that succeeds, then we're going to do a run on, on like the smaller size class in the, in the background. So the default is when if, whenever like it, it, it thinks that there's like no real harm in it, it will like first try to run it on the small size class. And if that fails, it will fall back to the large size class. But in the case, there's like a high probability of it being the wrong choice, but it still needs to be done for training purposes. It will like first run it on the large worker and afterwards run it on the small one. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, we got two questions. Let's start with the top one. Uh, regarding pr predicting the best worker to execute an action, does Bazel take into account the processing power of workers, resources used, available system load and so on, um, and when they executed past actions? So uh, Bazel itself doesn't do that at all, as far as I know. It's uh, Bazel sort of treats the, the cluster as sort of being um, opaque, right? It, it sort of simply schedules actions to be run on it, and it's it's basically up to the cluster to implement this this kinds of smartness, right? It's um, I've noticed that even like the statistics that Bazel gathers on like the remote execution duration is is invalid because it sometimes even um, includes queuing times in, in those times as well. So you can say like, you know, this action took 500 seconds to run, even though if you would take a look at it from the actual cluster side, it only ran for like 10 or so seconds. So, um, yeah. And what are the metrics that are, that are useful? Um, so in, in, in this specific case, um, so what, what we do is like with VB schedules, we are, we're only looking at like, you know, what we've then done is we've, we've simplified the entire model where like we express the size of a worker as a single integer, right? Uh, you know, uh, and that could correspond to like gigabytes of RAM or CPU core count, right? And we're sort of only comparing that against execution times. And those are the only two values that we're using for this solution at least, right? It's uh, in the end, it's all about execution time and you know, how much resources it used in the process is basically irrelevant. All right, thank you. Uh, does Bill Barn use Bazel's test size attribute to make any decisions? So uh, that's a really good question. Um, as far as I know, the actual tests, so test size controls two things as far as I know. Uh, 
Um, first of all, it could be used to sort of convey like the actual resource requirements of a test, but also it can be used to convey the duration of a test as far as you know. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that, but like how much resources is being used, that, that part actually doesn't end up on the line. If you take a look at sort of the actual remote execution traffic, that data simply doesn't, doesn't get lost. You declare it in Bazel, but it isn't there, right? Bazel only gives us an execution timeout, but it doesn't give us actual uh, resource requirements based on what's declared in build files, apart from the platform properties. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what, what if you have multiple actions, one of which uses lots of CPUs, the other one RAM? Uh, how do you distinguish uh, in terms of the uh, class size? Oh, um, so so we don't. Um, you know, it, this this model is all big. You know one-dimensional right it's we um there's sort of this implicit assumption that like whenever you set up your cluster most likely your servers will all be of the same shape right they'll all be say 64 core systems having you know i i don't know 256 gigs of ram or something like that and then you sort of partition them up right and these size classes um you would basically use them to sort of like determine like how thorough the partitioning of a server is so whenever you set up a cluster you just like group the servers uh you know into those different size classes and you um you know you chop them up accordingly so for size class one a 64 core server you would chop it up in 64 small parts whereas for size class two you would only chop it up in 32 parts and for size class four in in uh, 16 parts right so it assumes that there's like this linear progression both in cpu count and memory yeah all right um we have two more questions so i'm not sure if we have time for both but we'll start with one uh presumably this works best if all actions are deterministically either of uh, either fail or succeed and um, this is the case for most uh, computer invocations but may not hold uh, uh, for example when running uh, poorly written unit tests and so the question is, have you run into these kind of issues and how you mitigate that? Yeah, it, 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 well, it's, it's a, that's sort of like a bit of unfortunate about like this entire thing is that, so if an action is flaky, there's a fair chance that it will fail on a small worker and then later on succeed on a large worker. And DB Schedule will currently interpret that as if the, um, uh, you know, the small worker was apparently not large enough to run it, right? Um, that unfortunately means that for like flaky tests, there's sort of a bit of a skew where it will run those on um, large workers a bit more aggressively, right? Uh, which on one hand is bad because it costs more money. But on the other hand, um, I think that's also acceptable because it means that, you know, the test is flaky. And if it's flaky, every time that happens, it needs to be rerun on the largest worker anyway to sort of rule out the possibility of it uh, being run on a worker that was too small. So you'd better run the flaky test on the large workers immediately, because that means that like whenever it fails, it will just fail in, in one go, right? If, if an action fails on the largest work, we never retry it. We know that it's sort of like a hard failure that needs to be sent back to Basil. So yeah, it, it, it all sort of works out even in the case of flakiness. All right, thank you very much for your talk as well as uh, your contribution to this uh, meetup. Yeah, thank you all for attending.